Hey guys, welcome back to the second part of my series about how fat loss works. Part two is fat metabolism, okay? So I don't wanna to go too much into digestion and uh, especially beta oxidation today, which we'll talk about later, but I do wanna talk about kind of overall how fat moves and fluxes in the body depending on what state you're in, okay? So fat digestion is much different than carbohydrate and protein. A lot of it occurs in the small intestine, mostly in the duodenum, and they're actually packaged into these, uh, these, these kind of fat, I don't wanna say vehicles, but they're called chylomicrons, and they're these big globules of fat, basically. So fat is what we call nonpolar. So you ever say, heard people say oil and water don't mix, right? Well, oil is fat. And if you take oil, put it into water, it will all, it will start up, it maybe start out as different droplets, but it'll eventually all come together, right? Like it'll, it will, it's what's called hydrophobic. And hydrophobic things want to associate with other hydrophobic things. So what you'll have is this, these big globules, what are called chylomicrons, and they're just big globules of fat. And they go through your, what's your called your lymphatic system, and they actually end up dumping out from digestion into the bloodstream somewhere up around your clavicle area. Um, so once they're in the bloodstream, they can then go to different tissues like the liver where they can be repackaged into like... They can be broken down and repackaged into like VLDLs, LDLs, HDLs, um, some other things. And they can also go to adipose tissue and then go to skeletal muscle and then go to other tissues like heart and, um, you know, some, any other tissue that, that burns fatty acids. So similarly, it, now keep in mind, whenever you cross a barrier with fat, okay, what happens is it, it has to be packaged because the bloodstream and all the other kind of the fluid parts of your body are hydrophilic. So they're, they're, they're mostly water. So they have to be packaged into something that can move through these mediums, all right? And then to get across the membrane, they have to be unpackaged, taken through the medium, and then repackaged, okay? So in the case of chylomicrons, for example, in the intestine, uh, the fat you eat goes through your digestive process and then it gets to the duodenum, you have pancreatic lipases that then break down those, uh, most of the fats we eat are, are triacylglycerides, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So they, they break down these triacylglycerides, they go through the intestinal lumen, they come out in the lymphatic system, or they go through the intestinal lumen, repackaged, and then go through the lymphatic system um, into the bloodstream, okay? Now these chylomicrons, when they get to, let's say, adipose tissue, they're then, again, broken down by lipases, okay, into individual fatty acids, and then they, are, then they can cross the membrane, they can cross the membrane of the adipose cell, all right? They can go into that fat cell, and then they're repackaged again into triacylglycerides, okay? So, and that's gonna happen in the liver and muscle, too. Whenever they, just I'm trying to keep, let you keep in mind, whenever fat crosses a barrier, it has to be, it, whatever package it's being delivered in, it has to be unwrapped, and then once it's in the, inside whatever membrane it's going to, it's rewrapped and repackaged, unless those fatty acids are then burned for a specific reason or they're oxidized. So if we, so we know that chylomicrons can go to these, all these different tissues and be delivered. Now let's look a little bit more at how fatty acid or how triacylglycerides are constructed. This is your storage form of fat. It's also how you eat most of your fat. Most of the fat you consume is in the form of triacylglycerides. Why do we call it a triacylglyceride? Simple. Tri, three, fatty acids, acyl. Acyl stands for a long carbon hydrogen chain, okay? So triacylglyceride, glyceride is a glycerol molecule. Okay, so over here we have, and this is how they're stored in adipose, mostly, as, as triacylglycerides, all right? Just, it's literally, your, your fat cells are literally just packed full of triacylglycerides, and it's your storage unit, all right? 
So you have your, these are triacylglycerides, you have this glycerol head here, okay? Right? Now, if, like for example, we're talking about adipose, and we're, we're gonna to get to these situations in a minute, but you're in a situation where you need to uh, liberate fatty acids and get them to another tissue. Let's say muscle's working hard, muscle needs fatty acids to burn for fuel. Well, remember, they're gonna cross a the barrier, they're gonna go out of the cell, so they have to be unpackaged so they can cross that membrane and then repackaged, okay? So what happens is there's a process that cleaves this glycerol, this glycerol molecule, okay? So this leaves, right, and you just get a glycerol molecule. Terrible handwriting. Uh, and that glycerol can actually then be used for what's called uh, gluconeogenesis, or it can just be uh, converted to, it can just be repackaged as another uh, triacylglyceride with other fatty acid molecules. Okay, they get, a lot of stuff in metabolism gets recycled. But it also can be used for, uh, for producing uh, glucose through gluconeogenesis in the liver. So you have, a, whenever you have uh, high rates of fat oxidation or you're burning a lot of fat, you're also having a lot of glycerol going to the liver because you're producing a lot of glucose through gluconeogenesis because it's usually when you're in a caloric deficit. So just keep in mind that those two things usually go hand in hand. So now you've cleaved this glycerol molecule. And now you're going to be left with three fatty acids. It's actually, the way it works is, the way it works typically is actually when you, when you go through lipolysis, you have first a, um, you'll have a reaction where there's a diacetylglycerol lipase where you have one fatty acid, a glycerol head, and then two fatty acids. And then those, that, that two fatty acids are then broken down and then you have three fatty acids. So it goes two and one, and then, and then the, the one that has two will be separated. So you're left with three fatty acids from every triacylglyceride. These fatty acids can now cross this membrane out of the cell, can then be repackaged, head to the muscle, and they can be used for energy. Or they can go to the liver and they can be repackaged and used for energy. Like any, any, any tissue can do this. All right. Now that we kind of understand the basics of how triacylglycerides and fatty acids and those sorts of things work. And I do want to be specific. You don't always have to repackage fatty acids when they're in the bloodstream. There are, there are a certain amount of fatty acids that do stay in the bloodstream. Um, but for the most part, for transport and storage, they're packaged as triacylglycerides. So for our purposes, that's how we're going to think of it. Now, let's talk about what happens during different situations, okay? Let's say you ate you were in a caloric surplus and you ate a high fat, low carbohydrate meal. So we have high fat, low carb, all right? Well, you're gonna get a lot of these guys, right? A lot of these chylomicrons, right? Because you ate high fat. All right? But it was low carb, so you don't have a lot of insulin. Insulin's a storage hormone. So you're gonna have low insulin. So you're not, you're burning, you're gonna be burning a lot of fat during this time, okay? So you're gonna have increased fat, increased fat oxidation. All right, um, even though you're in a surplus, you're still gonna be burning a lot of fat because that's the fuel you're providing if you're on a high fat diet. Um, but you're also gonna have a lot of fat storage, okay? So, you're, so some of these are gonna go here. There's gonna be a lot of flux into adipose. And contrary to what a lot of people say, you don't need insulin to store fat as body fat. I'll say it again. You do not need insulin to store fat as body fat, okay? So yes, you are burning more fat. You're also storing more fat. The net balance will be what we talked about last video. And if you haven't seen the last video, I'll go back and encourage you to go back and look at it. The net balance is gonna determine whether the overall effect is fat loss or fat gain. So if you're in a caloric surplus, 
the flux of fat into adipose is going to be greater than the amount you're burning, even though the rate at which you're burning fat is going to be higher than if you were on a high carb diet. Let me give you another example. So let's go with a high carb diet, relatively high carb diet, relatively high carb diet, but during caloric restriction. So we just gave the example of a high fat diet during a caloric surplus. Let's look at a low fat, high carb diet during a caloric deficit. So, so we're in negative energy balance. So we have high carb, low fat, okay? That means we're gonna have higher levels of insulin, but we have less fatty acids, right? So we had all those chylomicrons coming in. Well, if you're on a low fat diet, you don't have nearly as much, okay? Now, you are not going to, you're gonna have decreased fat oxidation. The rate of fat oxidation is going to be lower, but you're also going to be storing less fat because you're not eating as much fat, okay? Now, people may say, well, you can store carbohydrates as fat. Technically, yes, but that's called de novo lipogenesis, and we'll just call, and that happens in the liver, and that's called DNL, de novo lipogenesis. But the rate at which de novo lipogenesis occurs is, is that actually winds up in adipose tissue. So if we look at glucose, that goes, that's in the liver, that goes through de novo lipogenesis and then comes out as, uh, well, it'd actually be like VLDLs and LDLs. And actually ends up getting stored in adipose. It is a very, very, very small amount. Unless you are chronically on a very high carb diet, very low fat, de novo lipogenesis is not going to account for a significant amount of fat storage, okay? Now, what is going to happen is since you are higher insulin, you're gonna be burning more carbohydrate, less fat, so the fat that you do eat is more likely to be stored as fat, but since there's less overall fat, the, the how much actual body fat you gain or lose is once again going to be dependent on your total energy balance, okay? So just because insulin is high doesn't mean you're storing a ton of fat because if you're not eating much fat, there's just not that much fat to store, okay? Now it does mean that the fat you eat is more likely to get stored. So let me give you an example. Let's just use arbitrary numbers for a moment. So let's say you're eating 100 grams of fat, okay? Or oh, sorry, let's say 200 grams of fat. That means your oxidation is gonna be way up, fat oxidation. Carb oxidation is gonna be way down. And insulin is gonna be low as long as carbohydrates are, are, are low, okay? But you're also gonna be storing a lot of fat. So let's say we have 200 grams of fat we eat, all right? We have low insulin because it's low carbohydrate. We have high amounts of fat oxidation because we're eating a lot of fat. We have low amounts of carbohydrate oxidation because we don't need to because there's not that much carbohydrate available. But we've also got increased fat storage because it's a very high calorie. If we're in a positive energy balance, we're gonna be storing a lot. Even if we were in a negative energy balance, we'd be storing a lot. The difference if you're in a negative energy balance is that the amount that you are oxidizing will exceed the amount you are storing. I'll say it again, in a negative energy balance, the amount you're oxidizing will exceed the amount you're storing. So let's say of this, you're oxidizing, let's say these are both negative energy balances in this example, all right? Negative energy balance, let's say you burn, I'm just using 170 grams and you store 30, okay? All right, well, you're in a, in a negative energy balance. You're gonna lose fat in that scenario. But now let's go to, a high carb, low fat, all right? Now you didn't store, you didn't store much, or yeah, you didn't store a great proportion of the fat you took in. You store like less than a sixth of it because insulin was low, right? But let's look at what happens if we eat 
40 grams of fat. So we have decreased fat oxidation. Let's say we ate that and then like 200 grams of carbs. But we're still in the negative energy balance. Decreased fat oxidation, increased carbohydrate oxidation, but we have decreased overall fat storage. Absolute fat storage, but the percentage of the fat you ate is going to be sto more stored because of increased insulin. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say, let's say that 70% um, of this got stored. 70% gets stored of that. That is uh, 28 grams. And only 12 grams was oxidized. He said, oh my God, only 28, only 12 grams of fat was oxidized. Yeah, but they only ate 40, 28 grams was stored. You actually stored less fat if you're in a negative energy balance. You actually stored less fat with the high carb diet than you did with the low carb diet. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what happens. I'm saying that if you're in the same, if you were in the same energy balance, in the same amount of negative energy balance, high carb versus low fat, high carb versus low carb wouldn't make the difference on how much fat you actually lose or gain. It will make a difference on the rates of fat oxidation and the rates of fat storage or the percentage of fat you store from what you eat because insulin changes. But energy balance is always going to dictate how much body fat you actually lose. Now, real quick, Let's, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. Let's say you're in a negative energy balance. What, what happens, right? Well, if you're in an overall negative energy balance, regardless of whether you're eating high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, if you're in a negative energy balance, the flux is going to be out of adipose tissue because the amount of energy you're expending is greater than the amount of energy you're taking in. And thus, your tissues are going to require you to liberate fatty acids from storage in order to continue to function. Because the main goal of the body, you want to keep blood glucose stable. You also want to spare muscle glycogen. The body's pretty stingy with glycogen. In order to do that, what does it use to spare that? Well, it uses fat, okay? Because if you are burning more fat, if you're burning liberated fat, you're not using blood glucose. You're not using muscle glycogen as much for things you don't need it for. Because muscle glycogen is something that is a very specific purpose for a very high intensity, short burst, right? See that line? We got to run from that line, right? You don't want to be out of muscle glycogen when you go to do that, right? That's why the body's very stingy with it. Same token, if you're in a caloric surplus, like we talked about last time, if you're in a positive energy balance, even though you may be, if you're on a high fat diet again, you may be burning more fat, you're also storing more fat because you're taking so much more in, okay? And so the flux is going to be into adipose tissue. All right, guys, I hope this has helped you understand uh, fat metabolism a little bit more and how kind of fat fluxes throughout the body. Um, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth in some of the, the coming series. If there's some stuff I'm missing or some stuff you'd like to see me address, uh, ask it in the comment below. Also, here in a few weeks, I have a seminar coming up in Miami. Um, we've sold out completely the VIP spots, but we still do have standard uh, seminar spots. And I'm going to talk about some of this stuff that I'm talking about here, but in person, you can ask me questions. It's going to be awesome. If you're interested, check out the description. We'll put a link below. And we'll also put a clickable link here in the video as well. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you next time.